Expiration Saturday. I'm your host, Ebony Tyler. I have real conversations with real people about real jobs. So this week, my guest is Natalie Howard. Now, me and Natalie, we've known each other since our bug days at the Brooklyn Urban Gardeners program over at the Brooklyn Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Uh, We learned so much there. So Natalie is a registered nurse, and she is in the midst of completing her nurse practitioner program. She is passionate about taking care and bringing quality health care to Black people and other marginalized communities. We talk about allostatic stress. You know, that stress that comes with being a Black person in America? She breaks it down for us. Our conversation was so inspirational. I really had a great time talking to Natalie, um, and I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. All right, let's jump right in. Welcome, Natalie. Welcome to Career Exploration Saturday. I am so happy to have you here today. How are you? I am so wonderful. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So we start all the conversations. Tell us about who 16 Natalie was. Did you have it all together? Did you know what you wanted to be when you grow up? Let's see, 16-year-old Natalie. I think I'm really kind of the same as I was when I was 16. I was pretty headstrong and um, courageous and adventurous. So I always liked to try new things. Mm -hmm. And I I gravitated to the sciences. It was something that I found the human body to be tremendously interesting and the idea that it always worked to... um, to to get us back to our stability. And so the first time I heard about what's called homeostasis and learning that your body attempts to regulate itself to a a consistent, uh, to be consistent. And so if you cut yourself, your body is going to to clot. And so your body does these things that heals itself. And so learning about that at 16 or as a young person and then carrying that interest forward and as a 16 year old, it inspired me to join science clubs and to gravitate to my anatomy and physiology teacher and just to be a, 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 a very annoying 16 year old asking tons of questions or going and spending time with her, you know, during my break because I wanted to learn more, understand more. And so 16 year old me, was bright eyed and ready to take on the world. And I also felt like I was an advocate. Like there was a part of me that felt like I had to defend people or to protect people. And that as a nurse, it's, you know, we are uh, patients advocates. And so that is something that has been with me for you know, my entire life. So wait, a 16-year-old Black girl interested in science and and in science club, what was that like? Was it like, were you the only girl? Were you like the only Black girl? What was that like? Because I just picture, you know, I I don't picture it. (laughs) Well, there was not, I was like one of the only, I was always the only Black student in my class. Like I I rarely had any, you know, other Black students in my class, but I had a a collective of black people that I gravitated towards. Okay. Um, and so it was, it was interesting because being able exposed to, you know, different things and having fun assignments, it wasn't, it wasn't too far out of my normal thing because the people who I was in the club with were also people that I was in class with and we were, you know, friendly with each other. And so it was, it was interesting or like we'll take little field trips and things like that. It was just, it was a good experience. Nice. So you know what? I was on Twitter the other day and someone had put a question and they said, when was the first time you dissected um, a frog, a fetal pig and a cat? Was it high school or was it college? It was high school and college. And I, I hated it actually. I, I, 
I don't like dissecting things. It's okay. not something, especially animals, because of how I feel about animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, actually, <laughs> in high school, we, um, our um, professor, Tom, our, uh, our teacher, Miss Thomas, she had us dissect chicken breast. And so that, to me, was a low bar and I appreciated it. It was like okay. chicken. I had been handling chicken my whole life. And so it wasn't anything that was scary. But when I got into college and, you know, I had to dissect a frog and a cat, like who's, that wasn't my thing. Like, I know it's interesting, but to cut into something, it's just, it, I'm not a surgeon for a reason. I'm not into surgery for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. So you went to um, Arizona State University and you have a bachelor's degree in nursing. What was your time like um, at, at Arizona State? And why did you choose Arizona State? Um, it was my local school and my uncle went to Arizona State. He played football for them. I, I was my local school. My mom works there. And I just, it was like, to me, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't considering leaving Arizona to go out away to school. And of the colleges, like, it seemed like the best fit for me because it was close to home. Like, I was not ready to leave my near, living near my, my mother. Right. It was, um, it grew into a really top-notch research school. Actually, while I was there, it became, it started to emphasize research. And it was just a local college. And that's what I wanted. I didn't want to go far. I wanted to stay in Arizona. I had received such quality education there my entire life. And so just being there was really cool. And I chose nursing and the nursing program was actually the first accelerated nursing program that they offered. And so I, it was really, uh, once I was accepted into the program, I like there was nothing else for me to even consider because even getting into nursing school can be really challenging for people. And so the fact that they had this program that was new and it had us clustered. So the way they ran the program is you were with the same 10 people from the beginning of the program until the end. And so you had a built-in community that you could ask questions of and learn from, catch rides with, you know, commiserate with. And so it was really strong um, to, to develop, you know, a, a network of people. And that, you know, in healthcare, you really, well, at least in the types of healthcare that I've embarked upon, it's not a silo. It's important to be operating within a system, to be operating with people, to be able to communicate. And so that was a really good foundation for me to learn how to really interact on a, in a mature way in, a, in regards to health care and communicating with, uh, with people. So after you got your bachelor's degree, what did you do? Like, what was your first nursing job like? And then, like, how do you find your first nursing job? Do you go online? Like, do you... Do you get it from like doing your clinicals and your rotations? How does that work? Is there an internship? Yeah. And so I have worked in healthcare pretty much my whole life. And so I was working at hospitals and things like that when I was, you know, like 17, 18. And my first nursing job, it was, well, in nursing school, before you graduate, once you're at your senior level, you can do externships. And so nursing externships are um, where you get the hands-on experience of being, you, uh, uh, you will be equivalent to what would be called a CNA mm -hmm. or a nurse's aide, uh, but you have more education training. You have people spending more time with you, explaining rationale and you know investing in your career as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so my first career as a nurse was, you know, I think it was a, it was a, it wasn't a telemed floor. It was like a step down unit. And so it was like low acuity, not anything super high risk or anything like that. And it was inpatient. And so getting in there, it was really nerve wracking. And, you know, being this young little 20 something, you know, intimidated by all the, all of this like technology and this language and it's a completely different, you know, culture and to be able to um, adapt to that culture is a really big skill set. And so the hence the training to be prepare you to become a nurse. 
Uh, my first official job after nursing was in a, telem a telemetry unit. And so that was a step down to the ICU. So telemetry is when they can look at your heart. And so it's for people who've had heart attacks or, you know, um, issues with their heart and they need to be, um, they need to be connected to a monitor so that, that you can look that their heart and make sure that their heart is, you know, not having too many arrhythmias and things like that. And so that was, super intimidating it was like going directly and like most people don't choose that path of going into like acute care when they first graduate because it's really complex and complicated and scary and things like that because your life people's lives are in your hand and so that one was really it was really challenging and it helped me even to this day to be able to to have the confidence to say, you know, I attempted something, I tried something, and it was not what I wanted to do. And so it gave me a, a, a parameter or a bar to say, okay, I like this, like I like emergency medicine, or I like fast paced medicine, or I like long, you know, to be able to be with one patient over and over and over you know, every day for an assignment versus I like to see people in an emergency room and just, you know, meet them, take care of them, patch them up and send them out. And so as a nurse, one of the things that I find amazing and even where I'm at now is it's such a broad perspective, uh, profession mm -hmm. and you're never limited at all. There are no limitations in nursing. There literally are none. You can always try something new. You can always, you know, move to any part of the world and you'll have a job. Like no matter where you go, they're looking, except for like, you know, in certain places where they are not hiring outside healthcare professionals, yeah. but the opportunities that you have are just limitless and people have such a tremendous amount of respect for nurses. And one of the things that I learned about when I was in the nursing program, my first nursing program, was that nurses for the past 20 years have been the number one trusted profession out of every single profession. And the only time that it has not been is when 9-11 hit and firefighters wow. were named as the most trusted profession. And so with nursing, it's expanding. It's, you're not limited. You, if you don't like blood, you, don't, you can go be a forensic nurse. You can be an informatics nurse. You can be a professor. You can, le you can have your own clinic. You can become an, 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 a nurse anesthesiologist. You can be, you know, there's so many fields and it's only expanding. Um, so having my master's opens up more doors for me. And so now I'm at the place where I can have my own clinic. I can have my own things and I can take care of a patient population that's important to me. And so for me, working with black people and taking care of black people and promoting health for black people, that's, that's all I wanna do. And I can do that. Like it's, it's in my wheelhouse now, it's what I'm trained to do. And so it's just always look at what you're doing so for me, it started with my interest in science in high school and junior high, and I built on top of that. I built and I added experiences, and I learned about different things that was important yeah. to me. And so I just think that taking each step towards your goal with the idea, not necessarily the whole thing, because I, I wanted to go to medical school. I thought I wanted to be an MD. But the more I worked with doctors and the more, you know, I traveled around the country as a traveling nurse, which, I didn't want to do that. Which is a question. I have a question. What, so I have two questions, right? What's a travel ER nurse? Because you've done that. <laughs> and then um, you talk a lot about um, that the, the um, space is wide open. So my question was, we tend to think of nursing as a profession that happens in the hospitals and doctor's offices, but you've also worked in, in corporate nursing spaces. So what is that? What is corporate nursing spaces and what is a travel ER nurse? Yeah. So 
really like once you are working as a nurse for one year you're able to begin and so you can specialize and so one of the specialties that i had was as an emergency room nurse and i worked in atlanta at grady memorial hospital the only trauma medical center in atlanta honey I <laughs> for trauma. And, <laughs> and it just and so when i was i was a traveling nurse and i moved from seattle to atlanta and i worked at emory in gastroenterology but i knew i wanted something a lot more fast paced and acute and critical and adrenaline filled and exciting and so i um i went and took a, pos a position in the emergency room and i got the year of experience that i needed and so when it was time for me to start traveling, I had a couple of different uh, specialties that I could travel as. Wow. And so I would like, when I was in my twenties and thirties, I was like, I don't want to work during the summertime. Like I want summer break. And so I would just work, you know, from like November until like May. And then I take a couple of months off to be honest. And so travel nursing, so as an emergency room travel nurse, um, you, you sign up with an agency, Mm. And the agency will, you know, let you know all of the, of the different eligible positions for you within their agency. And once you find a position that you're interested in, you submit all of your application information and then you have to get tested. So they have skills based tests to make sure that you are qualified. And then once you have your test, you can have an interview with the hiring person. So the contracts, so when you're a traveling nurse, you have contracts and the contracts are anywhere between several weeks to a year. And you are, you learn about, you know, how to develop yourself as a professional because you have to gain people's trust, you know, and so working, you know, and so traveling, um, it, it helped me to become um, adept at picking up things quickly mm. and, you know, learning on the fly and doing that over and over and over again to the tune where it doesn't matter which hospital, wherever I go, I'm so comfortable because I've been in this system for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and so when you're, you can, again like so i had two different types of travel i did gastroenterology i've also done emergency medicine and so once you pick up these specialties you can just take off and like the pay is wonderful you know you have benefits you have health insurance they give you company cars they give you per diems they give you a lot of stuff a lot of stuff <laughs> and it's wonderful maybe I it's should, cool uh... Maybe I should go be a nurse. <laughs> Nursing is awesome. <laughs> so now, talk to us a little bit about why is it important um, to work with, with Black people? And why are you so passionate about taking care of us? I mean, especially with COVID-19. Yeah. So I don't know if you watched the debates last night, but one, um, Biden said, and I'm, I'm you know, that one in 1,000 people have succumbed to COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, our African-American people, black people have succumbed to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, to me, it doesn't, the healthcare system is broken. Mm -hmm. And it is built on systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced way too many times as a black person and, you know, being on the receiving end of medical treatment at the hands of someone who is callous and doesn't understand, you know, my body because they think it's different because my skin is brown and melanated, which is not true. Like you, you study anatomy because underneath the skin, it's all the same. Like it's literally all the same. And so the work that I've done what community work that I've done has been geared towards working with black people because I, m myself, my family, I want to make sure that there's people out there who look like me, who can commiserate, who can treat, who can articulate, who can advocate, you know? And so 
because I know the, the, the beats that we're in, I think that us having excellent advocates and access to tremendous health care is important. Our health care system has historically, like when I worked at Grady, they will call it, quote unquote, the Grady's because there were two Grady's. There was the white Grady and the black Grady. And it's in their history. It's built into the history of it, this type of fractured health care. And so being able to mend health care together and give great support and great health care to Black people who historically received less than treatment and treatment that they don't deserve. Like, I remember becoming so disheartened uh, being in that experience and hearing about people who had had hysterectomies and they didn't know why they had hysterectomies. They had their uteruses removed and they didn't know why. And so it became important for me to be able to, to put myself in a position where I can speak to people and advocate for people and to educate and train people and give um, people information so that they can arm themselves with knowledge and, and, and advocate for themselves if I'm not available, which I'm not going to always be available. But that doesn't mean that people get to just be get treated any old kind of way, which is absolutely, I think, happens a lot when, with people who, and not just Black people, but just people who are marginalized in general, gay people, trans people, you know, folks, women, you know, we have a, we have a record of not getting the best treatment. Yeah. And so it's important to, to be able to speak up and to, to, to knock down those walls for folks. So we need more black nurses. Yeah, we do. We need more black nurses, more black doctors, more providers. We need, I personally feel like we need healthcare systems that are catered to us. I think that there's, that's the only way that we're going to be able to have healthcare that is equitable for us is if we have, if we can go to a, 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 a primary care provider who looks like us, because I, I, I think that pe white people and people out, outside of our nationality can provide care, but I also feel like that is also a time when people get some savior complexes going or all this other stuff that has nothing to do and shouldn't be a part of healthcare. Right. So I personally feel like it should be, really be black owned, black promoting, very black, very much for us. I'm gonna just let that just sit there for a minute. <laughs> All right, so you are currently at Samuel Merritt University um, becoming a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Cause there's levels to this nursing. It is, and honestly, like this is the middle level. I'm actually going applying for my doctorate uh, in nursing as well because you got if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Do you, know, it. you don't have to do it. You do it all the way. This is what I'm talking <laughs> about. So what is it? Like, tell, tell us about um, your being in this program, you know, your yeah. physical rotations. What, what, are you, what are you learning? What, what more are you learning? Well, there's, it's so cool. Um, as a nurse practitioner, you are, you are an advanced care practitioner. And so you, I'm able to order diagnostics, MRI, MRIs, everything that a patient needs in order to be taken care of. Mm. Um, I'm at the helm of the, of the healthcare. So I'm not receiving orders. I'm at the point of giving orders and writing orders. And that's really important to be able to to do that as a black woman, to be in charge of, you know, what is um, allocated out to your patient, because it means that you, you own it. And so I'm in the place where I can own my work. I can own the care that I give to people instead of administering a, an order that someone gave to me. Mm -hmm. And I have what's called clinicals. And so we have about 500 hours of clinicals that were, well, it's supposed to be more, but COVID just messed it up. So it's 500 hours right now. And so I've had three semesters of clinicals since um, winter of last year. Okay. And I've worked in urgent care. I've worked in family medicine. I've worked with all different types of patient populations and as well as working in telemedicine, 
which I think is a very important way of giving people care, not only now, but in the future. And I think that that will be a great equalizer for excellent care as well, because everyone will have, or more people will have access to their primary care. Mm -hmm. And I decided to become a family nurse practitioner because I, uh, to be able, as a family nurse practitioner, you are the primary care provider. And so that means that it's my ultimate responsibility to prevent diseases from happening. And that's through education and, 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 t and speaking to my patients about their lifestyle, diet, family stress. Um, there's this thing called allostatic stress. Allostatic stress is the things that the pressure load that is on top of black people's lives that leads us to have a greater rate of like diabetes and the sequela. So the sequela means the, the outcome or the event. So the, the harder events that occur for black people, a part of that is because of allostatic pressure. And so being at the helm of healthcare means that I can talk to my patients about that. And I can say, have you tried this yoga class? Have you tried this? Have you done this? These are things that can um, be used to alleviate stress, knowing this, what stress does to our bodies, to our hearts, to our minds. And then on top of that, you know, I have a history of being an herbalist and, you know, doing work within the community. And so being able to introduce, you know, these concepts to people and, you know, validate people's experiences because, Healthcare has often invalidated our wisdom and our knowing, and it has been, it's so patriarchal. And so people think that because this white guy said to do it, it should be done. Meanwhile, maybe your body doesn't need that. Maybe your body needs to go to sleep. <laughs> maybe your body needs, you know, tea time. Maybe your body needs hearty laughter. Maybe your body needs so many different things that traditional medical folks are in the United States won't even think about or consider to suggest to you because of how they've been trained and what they've been trained to value as um, appropriate care and treatments. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, can you give us a little advice? Like what should a young person who is considering nursing or what should they, what should they be um, thinking about, right? A young person who thinks they wanna be a nurse what should they be thinking about in high school, in college? Um, and then just some general advice on how to take care of ourselves in Narona. I mean, we got a family nurse practitioner. On. <laughs> Let's get some free medical care. <laughs> you better get that free medical care. So for uh, folks who are considering nursing, um, know that there's a beautiful lineage of nurses in nursing. And nursing is one of the most fierce professions that you'll ever think about. It is a profession that is built in revitalizing communities, taking care of communities, taking care of marginalized communities and very sick communities and, and, and fighting. Like nurses are fighters. And so if you wanna be a nurse, you're gonna fight for it. Everything that you do that's worth having, you're gonna fight for it. And you'll appreciate once you fight for it. And so what I suggest is learn everything you can that's science related. So if it, it, learn about the brain, learn about the body, learn about the anatomy, just start to learn and, and look at words and look at medications because it's all about all of those things. Right. So to every little like every little step that you take on your journey is not for not it's important it's not just a waste of time nothing that you do in service to yourself will ever be a waste of time and so being able to take little steps so you know going into your pill cabinet looking at medication so benadryl is diphenhydramine what where did they get those words from looking up um, so understanding Greek and Latin, you know, and understanding prefixes and suffixes, those types of little things that you train yourself to do now will help you in the future when you're able to eloquently read over things because you familiarized yourself with words. 
And so picking up science journals, um, going online and looking for people who are doing so on YouTube. YouTube's excellent. It's such a great free resource. resource. Going and, and looking at professionals, going, actually, you know what? Going and doing a Google search for people who are doing something that you might be interested in and seeing if you can shadow them. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't shadow a lot of people growing up. I just worked in those environments. Like I worked in hospitals. My first job was as a medical or second job was at a med as a medical biller because I wanted to understand more medical stuff. And so I put myself in those environments where I had to learn this language and hear these words that weren't familiar, but it helped me to become more familiar. Yeah. And so I think that that's really important is always placing yourself in this, the, the place of, of, of propagating yourself forward. Always, you know, and never taking, and if you fall back, make a mistake, you know, it's not really a mistake. Let's say you checked out nursing and you didn't like it and you found out that you're in love with the human brain and you want to become a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker, you know, it's never going to be bad to figure out and make mistakes. Right, right now, at this stage in your life, if you're not making a bunch of mistakes, then you're going to regret some of the stuff because you didn't get a chance to learn. And making yeah. mistakes is where you grow the most. And it's humbling. And so, and like I said earlier, nursing is really hard. And so it's humbling to have to study and, you know, not necessarily make the best grades or make the most excellent grades. It doesn't matter, but it's humbling. And to learn how to be humble and to not let that humbling experience to be a, a, um, a setback for you, but something as a, a stepping stone forward, you know? And so trying out a bunch of different things, it, getting a mentor is the most important thing that I think anybody can ever do for themselves. Because you can, if you can learn how someone achieved what they achieved, then, you know, the only thing that's stopping you at that point is yourself. And so having someone who's mentoring you, so going out in the community and finding someone who is doing the type of nursing or someone who can expose you to the type of nursing that you might be interested in, you know, just pick, or, and also volunteering. I think that volunteering as a candy striper or in the hospital is, or, or at a doctor's office, a clinic, anything, any experience that you can get is going to open your eyes and it's going to take you down the path that your heart desires you the most. And so I think that's really important is expo expo exposure and getting a mentor. And it, how do we take care of ourselves in the Rona? And in terms of taking care of yourself, one of the interesting things that I am thinking is sun make sure you get tons of sunlight make sure you wear spf so don't think that you don't need to wear sunscreen okay. get sunlight because you need that vitamin d so allowing the sun to strike your skin for like 15 minutes of the day of the day is very important opening up your windows and getting fresh oxygen into your your space is really important um i think having some type of routine because I know a lot of people are not working or unemployed or out of school. Having a routine for yourself for your mental health is really important. And so doing things, you know, that bring joy for you. So breathing, if that helps you, um, meditating, Tai Chi, working out, writing, make sure that there is um, some relief for mental health and um, being mindful of the self-talk that we have because I, 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 I am concerned about the amount of depression that goes unrecognized and all those different things. And so being aware of the, the language that we're using for ourselves is important. Being on top of your, your diseases. So if you have diabetes, making sure that, you know, you're not eating too much and that you're not checking your blood sugar regularly and that you're not taking your medication. You have to be even more um, on top of your health and managing your health. And so eating well, so that means no processed food, uh, 
anything that's super fried, super saturated in grease, super sweet, um, is not serving your body at all. Smoking is not serving anyone's body at all. Um, alcohol, even though they do say that there's a certain amount of alcohol that you should be able to moderately intake, it's not, it's not just decrease any amount of alcohol that you have because we don't know the things that are um, making this disease horrible in people. We don't understand. Like there, the science is all over the place. Yeah. Everyone has a theory and no one knows. And so the one thing we do know is people who don't have comorbidities have a high, have a, you know, a reduced chance of having the uh, more severe, uh, severe COVID outcomes. However, no one knows. And so just take care of yourself wash your hands more than you ever thought that you ever needed to. Don't touch your face, <laughs> wear your mask. Yeah. If you have a face shield, wear your face shield and don't go into crowded places, you know, and if you are in a place where there's more people than, you know, as legally limit or allow, try to be outside. Cause I, I the indoors versus outdoors is really important. Uh, if you have symptoms, the CDC is traditionally a very respected and trusted uh, source of information. With COVID, it's, you know, the information is who knows. But there's still organizations like the World, World Health Organization um, and also, you know, different trusted bodies like uh, Johns Hopkins and things like that, UCSF, uh, Kaiser Permanente, they have wonderful information. And so whatever information that you're going to be looking up, make sure that it's from a trusted source. Uh, not all information on the internet is true as we are aware of now. Yeah. And so make sure that if you are interested in learning more, that you're going to verified sites like the CDC, World Health Organization, and getting information straight from the researchers. So no hearsay, no Donald Trump said, don't listen to Donald Trump. Yeah, 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 that's it. Don't listen to Donald Trump and anything he says about the virus because it's not true. Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty much it. Take care of your, your, your mental health, your physical health, uh, eat nutritious meals, drink so much water, like at least eight to 10 glasses of water per day. You know, don't be dehydrated because you need to flush your body out of uh, the toxins out of your body. And that's that's my advice on taking care of yourself during COVID. Natalie, this was amazing. You you inspired me. I, I... <laughs> thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for sharing the story with us. It's my pleasure. I'm so grateful to be that I've known you and that you reached out to me because it's such an honor to even be asked or, you know, to, to participate in something like this because thank you. Thank you so much for holding space for youth and for folks who are still trying to figure it out at my age. Because <laughs> this is helpful for everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. So some takeaways are nursing is a broad profession. There is There are no limitations in nursing. You can always find something new. In the midst, it's the most trusted profession. And you can take your skills and go anywhere you want in the world. Two, nursing is hard work. But own it, fight for it, and prepare now for a career in nursing if this is what you want to do. Familiarize yourself with the language, the prefixes, get a mentor, job shadow, volunteer, explore. This is how you're going to find out if this is what you really want to do. Natalie sums up perfectly what liberated success is all about. And three, make mistakes. Making mistakes is where you grow the most. And learn to be humble when you make those mistakes. And thank you for some bonus information, Natalie. Sunlight, SPF, fresh air, routine for your mental health, being mindful of your self-talk, and do what brings you joy in the pandemic. Thank you so much, Natalie, and welcome to the Liberated Success family. 
All right, folks, listen, I am fresh off of a week's vacation and I am ready to close this year off strong. I am pleased to announce that Liberated Success has officially received our 501c designation from the IRS. Woo! This is huge. In six months, what I've conceptualized is here and we are ready to do the work to support our community in career development. We are $455 from our $5,000, from $5,000, right? Our goal is to raise $10,000, but we've got a promise of a matching donation of $5,000. So we need to raise $455 this week. Please, folks, if you could find it in your heart to hit that GoFundMe link and, you know, $10, $5, whatever you can do to help us reach our goal for our impact project, Liberated Problem Solvers. If you find our work informative, impactful, important, just show us some love. Thank you. And I'm kind of tired of coming on here every week, begging for money. No, seriously. Um, the link is in my bio. It's in Twitter. It's the first comment on Facebook. And if you're listening on the podcast, feel free to show us some love um, via listener support. Um, thank you so much for watching and listening all the way to the end. We will save ourselves. Wear your mask, wash your hands, physically distance, and all Black Lives Matter. See you next week. And we'll have another really great guest sharing their career journey. Bye. Hey,